Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and today I'm going to be listing my top five favorite Spider-Man artists. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups, and today we're doing a Robbie's Top 5. Today I'm listing my top five personal favorite Spider-Man artists. Now, this is a list that's going to be very different from person to person. So I'm really curious as to who are your top five favorite Spider-Man artists. Let us know in the comments down below. We got a brand new amazing Spider-Man number one arriving in April from Marvel Comics. We got John Romita Jr. announced as returning to Marvel, returning to amazing Spider-Man. And it always causes this kind of conversation, especially at the shop. A lot of people don't like JRJR's work. Some people do. Some people are right there in the middle. How does he stack in the top five for me? And who surrounds Surrounds him? Let's find out. At number five, I'm going to go Todd McFarlane. Todd McFarlane brought a dynamic energy to Spider-Man that was sorely missing in some of the years prior to him arriving on that title. He's the one that's most famous known for the spaghetti webbing, which I believe he kind of took from somebody else, but he kind of made it his own thing. Dynamic poses. Sometimes the anatomy didn't seem like it would work that way. Like the human body wasn't going to bend that way, right? But this is something that we see throughout the history of Spider-Man's artists, right? Like, absolutely. I love Todd McFarlane's work. Now, I wasn't the biggest fan of him back in the day. Back in the day when he was doing Spider-Man. Back in the day when he was first launching Spawn. It took a long time for me to truly appreciate Todd McFarlane for not only the mogul that he is in this industry, but for what he brought to the comic book page as an artist. Now, I definitely think that early Spawn is some of his top-notch work, but his Spider-Man run is really fun. Of course, co-creator of Venom in issue 300, 299, 298, whatever you want to consider the first appearance of Venom, he was heartily responsible for it, right? He was so successful as an artist for Amazing Spider-Man that they gave him his own title to write and draw. Starting with that Torment story, Lizard looked gnarly, looked ferocious, right? It's not the absolute best work from McFarlane, but it is still some of this most exciting, most dynamic, most game-changing Spider-Man artwork in recent memory, Todd McFarlane. At number four, I'm going John Romita Jr. That's right, I absolutely love John Romita Jr., especially on books like Daredevil, Punisher, his Thor run, but I've always in particular loved his work on Spider-Man. There was something about it. Spider-Man could just be swinging across the city for an entire issue, but the way that those images would flow was always mesmerizing to me. John Romita Jr. has got some of the strongest storytelling ability out of any modern comic book artist. He learned from the best, of course, his father, John Romita, and of course he learned a lot from a lot of artists and a lot of editors at that time. In a recent interview, with cartoonist kayfabe he talks about how jim shooter told him always to be establishing where you are always pull the camera back a little bit as something his father told him or something right i absolutely love his work now a lot of people don't like the style of his line work it's a little boxy it's a little wonky at times but for me the storytelling ability completely supersedes that, right? Like, honestly, really great stuff, great work emotionally with some of the characters' faces, but in particular, it's just the ability to tell a story and to do it quick. To just, The dude says that he could still do two monthly books a month if he really wanted to, but now he's kind of focused in on trying to refine his work just a little bit better. So needless to say, I am excited for him to show up in Amazing Spider-Man yet again in April. I've always been a fan, especially when he's got a great inker, Cloud Jansen, Scott Hanna, some of the best, JRJR, JR, I'm loving it. At number three, John Ramita. The original, the senior John Ramita, the, the original OG John Ramita, right? John Ramita came in and didn't necessarily have the most envious of jobs. He had a follow-up Steve Ditko on Spider-Man. Steve Ditko had, had put his imprint on that character. If you look at those first what is it, like 20 to 30-something issues of Amazing Spider-Man? It is imprinted with the identity of Steve Ditko as a penciler. John Romita came in, took what Ditko had established, and kind of glamorized it a little bit. Kind of made it feel less wonky and a little bit more superhero-y, but it absolutely works. It's some of the most iconic, legendary Spider-Man artwork you can think of. In fact, 
the Ditko stuff is great, and maybe he's on this list, but what Ramita did was kind of encapsulate everything from Ditko and the other Marvel artists around that time, John Basima, Jack Kirby, kind of threw it all together into his own distinct style and is supremely responsible, I believe, for the way the Spider-Man's been portrayed for decades and decades. John Ramita has got a nice clean line. I love the way he draws Mary Jane, Gwen Stacy. I love the way he draws Green Goblin. It's just absolutely absolutely amazing. Had a little bit more dynamic energy, a little bit more explosive action than the Ditko stuff, but still honoring what that legacy is. John Romita put not only his stamp on Spider-Man, the entire Marvel Universe. He was a longtime art director there. He was responsible. He's the guy that said yay or nay, and it shows he's one of the best. At number two, Steve Ditko. You can't F with the original. Steve Ditko brought this like awkward sensibility to Spider-Man, right? All of the Marvel heroes at the time, whether it's the Fantastic Four, whether it's the Avengers, well, you know, all that kind of stuff and in between, they're very heroic figures. Big, broad-chested men, lots of energy, lots of dynamic flow through the book, lots of just crazy Kirby crackle and all that kind of stuff. That's not what Spider-Man was supposed to be. Spider-Man was supposed to be a 15-year-old kid. He was supposed to be a nerd. He wasn't supposed to be, you know, hip with the ladies. He wasn't supposed to be the most popular kid. And you get that shining through in Steve Ditko's artwork. He also makes some of the most eerie Spider-Man. Like, Spider-Man in those earliest days with Steve Ditko and Stan Lee, He's kind of a creepy looking character, but he's got this awkward wonkiness to him that Steve Ditko completely just nailed. Also developing and designing all of these amazing characters around him, not just his supporting cast, but the villains, Dr. Octopus, Green Goblin, Craven the Hunter, Mysterio, Electro. These are impactful designs that still resonate visually with fans today. Without Steve Ditko, we wouldn't have the John Romita. Without Steve Ditko, we wouldn't have the Todd McFarlane. He laid that groundwork. He laid that foundation for what Spider-Man was supposed to be. A little awkward, a little eerie, and a little nerdy. And it all works. And it makes one of the absolute fanta most fantastic comic book characters in existence. Definitely one of the most popular. And at number one, I'm going Mark Bagley. Y'all, I told you this is my top five favorite personal favorites, right? I love Mark Bagley's Spider-Man. When I was growing up, the Tom McFarlane stuff was going on, and I was like, I don't know. I was reading Iron Man. I was reading Fantastic Four. But when I saw Bagley, something about that blew me away. The way he draws Venom. I remember when Carnage first dropped out. Like, what an amazing character design. It looks so freaking cool. Maximum Carnage. Spider-Man 375. I love Bagley's work. He takes everything that was established before, from Ditko to Ramita, to Ramita, who came a little bit afterwards, but you get what I'm saying. From Ditko to Ramita, through McFarlane, Eric Larson, he takes the best of all of it, he takes some of the wonky aspects, and he makes it all his own. I love his Spider-Man big head and all the big eyes, slender body. I love the way that he draws the other characters surrounding him. I love his Dr. Octopus, for instance, but of course his Venom and his Carnage. Carnage is one of the most gnarly things. How do you make a character that looks more deadly, more menacing, more vicious, and more badass than Venom. Carnage, to me, just blew me away. I fell in love with his pencils. And then, of course, he left the book, went on to do some other things with some success here and there. But then he comes back in the early 2000s to do Ultimate Spider-Man. And he didn't just pump out more of the same stuff from the previous 10 years that he had done, he completely changes some of his style up. He becomes a better storyteller. He becomes such an emotive, expression, expressionistic artist. Like, he has whole pages of just talking heads, because obviously it's a Bendis script for Ultimate Spider-Man, but he's got whole pages of talking heads that never feels boring. Each face from each moment of these characters having a conversation. Just look at Ultimate Spider-Man issue number 13, I think it is. That's the one where Peter reveals that he's Spider-Man to Mary Jane. The whole damn issue is just a conversation. An awkward conversation between an awkward kid trying to tell his girlfriend, or soon-to-be girlfriend, that he's Spider-Man. The emotive expressions on the characters' faces, the way they diverge, the way they shift from panel to panel, it's like real conversation. You can really pick up on the nuance of the characters' acting and still being able to give us the web-slinger in a very fantastic, dynamic, 
amazing and even ultimate type way. I adore Mark Bagley. Sometimes his work feels a little rushed. Sometimes it feels a little loose. But some of his best work on Spider-Man, 375, All of Maximum Carnage, 361, all this stuff, including Ultimate Spider-Man, I just get blown away. Every time I see his artwork, it just brings me back to being a kid, brings me back to that energy. I got to meet Mark Bagley. He's the only one out of these five that I've been able to meet. Super cool guy. Also, don't forget the amazing work he did over at New Warriors. Come on, keep thrashing everybody. Anyway, that's what I got. So that's my top five favorite Spider-Man artists. I want to know who are your top favorite Spider-Man artists? What do you dig? What do you like? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts, blogs, and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading. Station. Pop, pop. Boom!